Well, my grandmother always said things go better when you pray first. Let's do that. <laughs> Heavenly Father, use me tonight as an instrument that I will speak through me. So whatever results that you desire here tonight will be accomplished in all things. Thy will, not mine, be done. And God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. You know what I love most about AA, and I love everything about AA, is the simplicity of it. As you will come to understand as I go through this tonight, I'm a very, very simple guy. I'm about as simple as you get. And uh, somewhere in our book, there's a line that says, remind the prospect that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. To me, that's a bottom line statement in this thing for me. The single most important fact in my life as I stand here in Manaka, Pennsylvania tonight, is that I got a power in my life that I choose to call God who does for me one day at a time what I could never do for myself. I establish and grow in that relationship one day at a time through living to the best of my ability, the program of recovery called the 12 Steps is outlined by the founders in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is the reason that I always pray before I introduce myself from behind the podium, is to keep me reminded of the truth. And the truth is simply this. Left to my own devices, I absolutely guarantee everybody in this room that I would have destroyed myself years ago. See, I'm not a guy, and when you listen to me tonight, you know, we don't, we, in here we relate, we don't compare. I can tell you now, from the day I picked up my first drink to the day I came to you, I had no prolonged periods of sobriety. I'm an alcoholic. I'm one of them guys, you know, and I hear people say, you know, the heat was on. I was going to prison. You know, my wife was leaving, whatever was happening. And I straightened up for about six, eight months, a year, and, other, and I believe that. And that is some people's story. That ain't mine. I'm one of them alcoholics. When the heat is on, I drink more. Okay? I become more restless, irritable, and discontented. When I read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and started with the doctor's opinion and it described alcoholism as I know it today, it scared me half to death. I thought somebody had been following me around. Scared me half to death. I'm a guy that on my own, no matter what's at stake, no matter how much I don't want to, it doesn't matter. I am powerless over alcohol, and until I find a power, it ain't stopping, and it never did. I've gone to court drunk, facing drunk charges. <laughs> I've been in the hospital as a direct result of drinking alcohol and got drunk in the hospital. When my job, when my family, when my freedom, eventually when my life depended on me not drinking, I drank. That's the reason I pray for I tell you who I am, because I ain't here because of me. I'm here because of God just programming people like you. And it's important that I remember that. That prayer reminds me of two things I always like to say that I believe is vital and crucial to me staying here. First and foremost, the reason I'm here tonight is to do God's will, not mine. And it also serves to remind me that he is in charge here tonight. And as always, thank God. <laughs> I am not. Good evening. My name is Kent Coleman. I'm an alcoholic. I want to first off thank the Friday morning grapevine group for once again inviting us to come out and to participate in this celebration of Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's what I consider this. Um, it is an honor to, I don't know, because you know me and Ralph been tight for a long time, and I don't speak for nobody else, but I can say this about myself and my friend. It was a time we weren't getting invited back no place. <laughs> if you invited us somewhere once, that was gonna be it. No. I don't know the joke. My nickname used to be Poison. And I used to be proud of that. Oh, and this girl said one night, why y'all call him that? Somebody said, invite him over your house. <laughs> <laughs> you will find out. It, it, is, it is so cool today to be invited to come back to places and to see all of you. you as a lot of y'all know, this is a home going for me. I got kinfolk here in Manaka. I got kinfolk in Aliquippa. I got kinfolk 
in Swickley. I got kinfolk in Pittsburgh. My family is from here. My father from here. No, I was talking to my father the other day. My father went to Union High School, not too far from here. Union High School been gone a long time. I don't know if anybody ever even heard of it. But my father played football at Union High School, and he is still grinding over the championship loss to Cannonsburg 60-some <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Ask him sometime. He'll take you through every play. So it is uh, uh, some of my most fond, fondest childhood memories are being here in these hills. And um, it is an honor and a privilege to participate in the life-giving fellowship of alcohol. Because I, I, I got to say this about Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous brought me back to life. I came to you more dead than alive. I came in here mentally, physically, and spiritually done. I came to you. Um, I heard a young lady say it, um, emotionally flatlined. I came to you from a place where um, everything is great. There ain't no God, no devil, no right, no wrong, no good, no evil. And the three most prominent words in my vocabulary are I don't care. And I meant it from the bottom of my heart. I simply don't care anymore. And my mother used to say to me, you can't not care. And I used to tell her, I don't. Uh, and um, that's as far away as I ever want to get from God. And um, I don't ever want to forget that. Talk for very briefly to our new friends here tonight, new to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and what I want to talk about, when I came here, um, and I said that this is a simple program and I'm a simple guy. When I came here, I saw two distinct groups of people. First group of people, in and out, in and out, in and out. And I watched them. And it seemed like every time they came back, they were in worse shape than they were when they went out the first time. They came back in, No, I, I never seen them, they, nobody came back passing out $50 bills and driving a BMW talking about how good it was out there. <laughs> no, they came back um, more miserable, more afraid, and sicker than they was when they left the first time. And I watched those people. Then there was a second group of people. It's people like to put on this event this weekend. People who are laughing, who are happy people who are talking about God, big book, steps, and spirituality, people who have sponsors and home groups and help others, who stand at the door and shake hands. That's the second group of people. Didn't take me long to figure out which group I wanted to join. Now, I always say this is a simple deal. You know, my friend Al used to say, AA is monkey see, monkey do. Just make sure you follow the right monkey. <laughs> no. So I started watching these people who seemed to be doing well in here who were happy. Because I don't know about you, but I had had enough misery when I got here. And, uh, those people that were staying sober seemed to have some things in common. First thing they had in common was they had something called a sponsor. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't know what a sponsor was. And I tell people all the time that when a new man walks or a woman walks through the door of Alcoholics Anonymous, then nobody sprinkle pixie dust on their head and all of a sudden they understand everything there is about the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I came to you, I had never been to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, nor did I know any living human being who had been to one or who would admit to having been to one. So I knew nothing about these things when I came here. And I asked them what a sponsor was, and they told me a sponsor is somebody that has working knowledge and experience with the 12 steps, who is willing to take the time to share the program with you, and just as importantly, walk the program in front of you so that you can see what can happen if you do the same thing. A sponsor is a living example of what this fellowship can do. I have sponsorship today. I'm sponsored by Bill F. and Lorraine, Kim B. and Parma. Bill got 40, 46 years, I think. Kenny got 39. Least impressive thing I can tell you about the sponsorship that I have today. What I can tell you about the sponsorship that I have today is that I've learned more from them being outside the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous than I have inside the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Being with Bill and Kenny, I learned some things. I learned how to be a husband. I learned how to be a father. I learned how to be a son. I learned how to be a brother. I learned how to be an employer. I learned how to be an employee, and I learned how to be a decent citizen in the community that I live in. When I came here, none of those things were active in my life. Um, I, it's hard for me to talk about Bill and Kenny, cause, uh, and I talk to them on the phone, one of them or both of them, daily. See, I haven't gotten too big for my britches in here. You know, the longer that I'm here, the bigger danger I am to myself because I start thinking I know something. 
you know, when something happened, I started thinking to myself, you know, I really don't need to tell nobody that. You know, I've been sober long enough now. I should be able to figure that. Note the operative word in that statement is I. Okay? I. Okay? And so what I learned when I came in here, real, real simple. If I do, I, I tell my sponsees all the time, alcoholics, the only people that I ever met in my life that will spend their entire life searching for something that works, find it, and then stop doing it. <laughs> my life got markedly better when I started to take certain actions. So being a simple guy that I am, I figured out that if I keep doing them, it'll keep getting better. If I keep doing them, it'll keep getting better. I always like to do this, and I'll do it tonight. Would anybody in this room who would be willing to sponsor a new person please raise your hand? Thank you very much. If you knew and you don't have a sponsor, I just hooked you up. <laughs> okay, see, nobody ever need leave a meeting without the benefit of sponsorship. And the reason that I do that, and we always laugh because it's kind of cute, but it really isn't. It's a very serious thing. Because when I was new in here, I didn't know who was willing to sponsor. I didn't know if you had 10 minutes or 10 years. So I do that for the new people here. And I cannot tell you how many times after a meeting somebody has walked up to me and said, hey, Kent, see that guy or see that lady over there? Yeah, that's my sponsor. This is a we program, not a me program. June 10th, 1935, a discredited stock speculator from New York and a broken down doctor from Akron come together in the same room. And the dynamic that is Alcoholics Anonymous from that day to this was born. One alcoholic sharing experience, strength, and hope with another alcoholic. Kent loves AA. Kent loves AA events. Kent loves to go. I, 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 I'm, oh, I'm a fanatic. I'm a fanatic. But let me tell you somewhere Alcoholics Anonymous is in my life is me sitting in my dining room table with a new man cracking a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and sharing experience, strength, and hope one to one. To me, that's Alcoholics Anonymous. Has been since June 10th, 1935, and it is today. Another thing these people had in common, they had something called a home group. Now, I didn't know what a home group was, and somebody told me that it's a place where you go and start to give back. Now, I have a home group today. My home group is the Friday Night Venice Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. They'll be rolling in about a half an hour. It's our 57th anniversary tonight of our home group. And uh, let me tell you something about my home group, and I always say this ain't the best group in the world, ain't the worst group in the world. It's just a group. Some of my sponsor Bill taught me when I came up in here, it's okay to stop competing now, young man. Okay? My entire life was lived on a better than or less than basis, all up here. You know, and when I live my life on a better than or less than basis, I'm never a part of. Okay? I cannot afford to not be a part of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a member of a group. Like I said, ain't the best, ain't the worst. It's a group. Our primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. I think we do a pretty good job of that. We have a lot of fun in the process. I'm not the best or worst alcoholic ever to come into Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm, just, I'm an alcoholic. Okay. And that's what I always like to say is the total package in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sponsorship, big book and step, home groups and service. In my experience, I have yet to see an alcoholic of our type. And if you don't know what an alcoholic of our type is, read the book. Come in here, take that total package, apply it to their life one day at a time to the best of their ability, which is all that is required. God don't expect me to be more or do more than I'm capable of. And go back out and take a drink. I ain't seen it happen one single time. The program of recovery was designed for success, not for failure. On the flip side of the coin, however, I have yet to see an alcoholic of our type come in here, ignore those things, and stay sane, sober, or happy for any appreciable length of time. The simplicity of Alcoholics Anonymous. Those who do get, and those who don't, don't. And it's just that simple. My sponsor, Bill, told me when I was new, he said, I don't know about you, but I never sat in a bar and watched somebody else drink and thought I was going to get drunk watching them drink. <laughs> It's a, that's just as ridiculous as me coming into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous watching you get a sponsor, work the steps, get a home group and help others and think that magically somehow that recovery is going to rub off on me. It's a program of action, not osmosis. Those who do get, those who don't, don't, and it's just that simple. 
Here are the steps we took. Not here are the steps I memorized. Here are the steps I analyzed. I was real good at that. Here are the steps I discussed. Uh, my sponsor Bill says, son, you got to took them. You got to took them. Me an alcoholic. Didn't know what that was before I came here either. Thought it was a lot of different things. You know, I had them, but just because I, I live in my head, I don't know anybody else in here do that. <laughs> uh, you know, I think I know everything, don't really know nothing. No, no, alcoholic, you know. I, when I was young, I thought, you know, it's Otis on the Andy Griffith show. Uh, remember Otis? Uh, I know, I watched every episode of the Andy Griffith show. Every episode. And I never seen Otis work no place. <laughs> Otis, I don't think Otis turned to tap in 400 episodes. No place. Always drunk, clothes wrinkled up. Yup, yup, yeah, yeah. That's the alcoholic, you know. <laughs> alcoholic is a person who you know, misses work, school, important things in life because of drinking. As a teenager, that started happening to me. Well, that, that, I, that must not be it. Alcoholic is somebody who goes to jail because of drinking. I came up with that when I was about 15, 16. As you'll hear, I really had to change that one. Alcoholic is a derelict underneath the bridge. You know, that was my last definition before I came to you. And the reason that was my last definition before I came to you, because that's the only thing that had not yet happened to me. You know, if I didn't have a family that I had, that's exactly where I would have been. You know. You know, I tell people I had the nerve to sit in an AA meeting in Port Clinton, Ohio, nooners meeting, and poke my chest out and say, you know, <clears throat> I ain't never been homeless. There was a man, God rest his soul, Jim Redmond. He died 52 years sober. He turned and he looked at me and he said, son, I got some bad news for you. He said, but if you grown and you living in your mom and daddy's house and you ain't paying no rent, you homeless. Jim Redman hurt my feelings. <laughs> no. Mental obsession, you know, can't stop thinking about drinking. No. Got a mind that would justify a drink at any level, under any circumstance, at any time. No. Irregardless of past experience, present problems, or future consequences, mental obsession, physical allergy. Once I put alcohol into my body, something happens to me that don't happen to nine out of 10 people. I put alcohol in my body and my body screams for more. That started happening to me when I was 14 years old. I knew then that I drank different than other people. You know, I, I would ride with the fellas, you know, we would be going to play basketball and we would piece up on some money get a little bit of beer, you know. Found out real quick, we do that before we play basketball, Kent don't play. I guard the beer, okay? <laughs> no, I guard, and I guard it good too, cause you ain't getting none when you get done playing. No, found out different. I always, always, I, I can remember sitting in high school and planning the weekend. It's Tuesday and I'm already thinking, the party store sold to us last weekend. We underage. They'll do it again. It's Tuesday. I'm already thinking about it. Already thinking about it. Can't stop thinking about it. You know, and, and, and as my alcoholism progressed, you know, I can remember uh, I had a heart attack when I was 28. I was in the cardiac unit for 48 hours. Called the family. The priest was up there. Done, you know. My mother stood in the hallway and said, I already lost my oldest son. I can't lose another one. Do what you got to do. And I'm laying there, tears running down the side of my face. No more, man. I ain't living like this no more. I ain't doing this no more. I'm killing everybody around me. I'm through with this. 48 hours, my heartbeat stabilized. They rolled me down the hall. They put me in a regular hospital room outside the cardiac unit. Two hours later, I was drunk in that room. You know what my mind told me? Whoo, that was close. <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, 
This calls for a celebration. This hospital ain't that bad. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Man, my fifth DUI, they had me locked up in the old county jail in downtown Sandusky. Fifth DUI. I'm sitting in a, I'm sitting in a jail cell. And I'm thinking, now what I should be thinking is, I'm not going to drink anymore. Certainly, I'm not going to drink and drive anymore. Here's the thought that went through my mind, sitting in there. Where did I go wrong? <laughs> now, I worked on that for about half an hour, and I'm gonna I finally figured it out. I shouldn't have driven down Perkins Avenue. <laughs> That's the problem. I should have cut through the south side. Okay, next time, Next time, I'll do it. And you wonder why they take people like us and put us in mental institutions. <laughs> I stood in front of the late Honorable Judge Stacy, and he said, what do you got to say for myself? I pointed to the cop that arrested me. I said, it's him. <laughs> Judge Stacy said, get this idiot out of my courtroom. Mental obsession to drink. See, y'all understand that, don't you? People outside here don't understand that, do they? No, they don't. They can't. This thing called alcoholism. Right? And Dr. Silkworth is really, really clear about something. He said, unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. And that his ideals must be grounded. It don't say ought to be or might be. Must be grounded in a power greater than himself if he is to recreate his, his life. <laughs> I'm 51 years old. I was born in the city of Sandusky, Ohio. I was the second of three boys. I was raised in a Christian home. I was taught the difference between right and wrong before I ever got out of the house. I had as fine a mom and dad as ever graced this earth. We never played a, a sport until we got to junior high school that our father didn't coach the team. We never participated in anything in school or in the community that our mother and father wasn't sitting right there in the front. We wasn't sent to church, we was taken to church. My mother was the president of Ohio Baptist Women's Convention. My mom and dad were the best. Mama worked for Chrysler. Daddy worked for General Motors. I'm retired from Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a great life coming up. I, I, we played. We played sports in every season. In the wintertime, we ice skated. We did, we, we, we did everything, you know. We did everything. And uh, it was a wonderful life. It was a wonderful life. But I'll tell you something, and I mean this. Bill said in the 12 and 12 that the 12 steps are a set of principles spiritual in nature. I was introduced to spiritually principled living before I went off to school. And our house mama always said honesty is the best policy. A real man is always honest with himself and other people to thine own self be true. In our house, we got automatic whoopings when we got caught lying. Did that happen in anybody else's house up in here? Hey, that's step one, isn't it? Principle of step one is honesty. My mother said to me one day, Kenny, come here. I'm concerned about you. I said, about what? She said, I want you to understand something, son. The sun don't rise when you wake up and set when you go to bed. She said, look out the window. Tell me what you see. Trees, birds, flowers, cars, people, sky, grass. She said, you think this all just popped up out of nowhere? She said, there's a power that's greater than you. And it created all of this, and all you have to do is be willing to believe that step two. Mama said, I'll carry that a step further and make a decision to put your life in the hands of the power that created all this. In my house, they call that power God. She said, you will always have what you need no matter what happens outside or around you. My mother was telling me the answer is inside, not outside, step three. In our house, they told us anytime you hurt, harm, or wrong somebody else, take a look at any, no, anytime you got a problem, take a look at it, come talk to us about it. Problem shared is a problem half solved. You're only as sick as your secret, steps four and five. Mama used to say the biggest room in a human being's life is the room for improvement. If you can make C's, you can make B's. If you can make B's, you can make A's. If you can make second team, you can make first team. And if you ask that power to help you in any positive thing you want to do, the power will always help you if you're willing to help yourself. Step six and seven. In our house, they told us anytime you hurt, harm, or wrong somebody else, take a look at who you hurt and right the wrong you're done. If you owe money, pay it. If you owe time, give it. If you owe an apology, make it. 
clean up your mess, steps eight and nine. Taught me that when I was a little boy. Mama used to say you can never go forward in this life if you don't know where you are today and what you need to work on to get wherever it is you want to go. Socrates said the uninventory life is a waste. Step 10. Our grandmother said the secret to having a good day is very, very simple. When you wake up in the morning, slide out of the bed onto your knees, say one word, please. As you go throughout the day, if you don't know what to do, ask that power for some help, just like you would a friend. At night, get back on your knees before you get back in the bed and say two words, thank you. Step 11. And in our house, they told us the greatest thing a human being could do in this life was not acquire money and material things, but was to be of service to other people. We were taught to follow the golden rule. Talk to folk you, the way you want to be talked to. Treat them the way you want to be treated. Respect your elders. Offer to share what you have with your friends and your cousins before you have your own. Be of service to others, step 12. I just took you through the steps. Was anybody else in here taught those things? I didn't think I was alone. Okay. To our new friends in here, spiritually principled living did not originate in Akron, Ohio in 1935. Those principles are ancient. And there's a whole lot of people out there that live like that every day and they don't expect a pat on the back for it either. I watch my neighbors. Somebody gone on vacation, somebody goes over, waters their grass, cuts the grass shovels the driveway. They don't go around the neighborhood saying, hey, did you see me? I cut Bill's grass. <laughs> I hug my sponsees. I tell them I love them. I tell them you're doing a good job, and I'm telling them you're doing what you're supposed to be doing all along. I always want a pat on the back. I was seven months sober. I went to see my grandmother. I said, Mama, guess what? She said, what? I said, I paid my bills seven months in a row. She looked at me and said, it's a big deal. I paid mine 72 years in a row. Get out of here. <laughs> huh? See? <laughs> it, it takes a while, don't it? It takes a while. It took me a while to understand I'm not doing nothing unique. I haven't learned nothing new in here. These are, these, these are principles I was taught as a child. However, you know, now I say, you say, well, Ken, if you was taught those things as a, chi as a child, what are you doing in here leading an AA meeting tonight? Answer is simple. I never did any of them. Talked about them a lot, especially down at the bar. You, know, you, ever, say, you ever be in a bar and be somebody in there quoting scripture? That was me. <laughs> huh? I said, now the Brownlee's Tavern. So somebody used to have a meltdown down there. My mother called Brown Lee's a den of iniquity. <laughs> you know what I told her? You bet you. Huh? <laughs> somebody would melt down every Friday. I worked a midnight shift. We'd get down there, 8 o'clock in the morning, get drinking. Usually about, oh, about 11 or 12, you know. Somebody would, woo -hoo. Everybody would surround them. We'd all buy them a shot, you know. And it was usually because he was getting divorced, going to jail, or losing the job. But that's what we did down the Brown Lees. And a Kent would say something like this. Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 27. I'm quoting scripture down to bar room. Giving spiritual guidance down to bar room. Huh? Didn't stop there. I thought, you know, I give marital counseling down there. I, I never had a wife, but I didn't see how that made any difference. Huh? With my life savings in the bartender's cash register, I get financial guidance down there. Huh? Huh? It's amazing, ain't it? Bartender driving a brand new Cadillac. I'm working in an auto plant and ain't got a car. What is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture? <laughs> and that's how I live my life. And I can't see none of that. I can't see none. I'm down there telling people, yeah, this is what you ought to do. That would be a good thing, you know. <laughs> my daddy called me a walking encyclopedia of perfectly useless information. <laughs> Just said, not, see, none of it was born of my experience. What I was was a parrot. Huh? 
I, I read a lot. I watch a lot of TV. I listen to other people talk. You know, done that in here, too. You know, sat in meetings, hear something, sound good, go out and repeat it, have no idea what it means. A lot of times those things were contrary to what this program suggests. My sponsor pulled me to the side one day and said, young man, I'm going to tell you something. There's a big difference between carrying the message and spreading the disease. If you open your mouth, you better know what you're talking about and it better come out that book. I have to be careful in here. Restless, irritable, and discontented, a fifth wheel, never fitting in, always, always feeling somehow disconnected. And not just, not just out in public, even in the house, even in the family, somehow feeling somehow different. See, I had an older brother and a younger brother. Older, oh, my older brother was, you know, the firstborn son. You know what they say, well, you know, ain't nothing like the first one. I remember my uncle always used to say that. Ain't nothing like the first one. My little brother, he was the baby coochie cuckoo. You know, everybody loved that baby. <laughs> And I'm over there thinking, mm-hmm, what about me? You know, it's a great thing about being sober is the ability to look back in truth. Look back in truth, I was never treated any differently than either of my brothers. Actually, I was my mother's favorite. You know, I got this perception thing. You know. My first drink of choice was my older brother. My older brother, well, my family, and I, I talked about my dad, and they come from around here, and they played a lot of football. And uh, at the college level, and I had cousins that played in the NFL, you know, nothing, a lot of that in my family. And uh, my brother was, you know, headed for bright lights in big cities. I mean, it, you know, I come from a high school that turns out – NFL guys like a machine. We had uh, uh, 1966 and 1967. There was nine NFL players come out of them two classes at my high school. That's what at Sandusky High. That's what we did. And uh, my brother was going to Ohio State, and uh, he's a running back. And on uh, September the 5th of 1972, he died of a head injury sustained in a scrimmage in Maslin, Ohio. And uh, Obviously a devastating event in my life. Obviously it broke my heart. Obviously it almost killed my mom and daddy. Obviously it damn near killed my grandmother. Messed up our whole town. Father's house said biggest funeral in the history of Sandusky. Make me an alcoholic? Absolutely not. You stop any car out on the street tonight and you'll find similar stories of death and tragedy as part of life, is it not? What it did to me is it took away my comfort. I hid behind my brother. My brother was the kind of guy that he walked into a room and, and, and it was just like E.F. Hutton. Remember how he said E.F. Hutton, scared to say something? Everybody, that's what he was like. He could have run, he wasn't a great student, but he used to tell my mother, I don't, what I'm getting ready to go do, you don't have to have A's. You know, and um, could have run for class president and easily been elected. He was just one of them guys. And some of us have been around those types of people. And um, after my brother's gone, I'm hanging out. Guy's my own age. Now I don't have my brother to hide behind. My, I, don't, I no longer have the sense of ease and comfort that I used to find in his shadow. And I'm out there now, and it's like I'm naked to the world. you know. And, um, and man, I am so, that self-centered fear, man, I'm so full of me. I'm thinking that everything I say and everything that I do is being watched by everybody and critiqued by everybody. And what I know now is it was being watched and critiqued by nobody but me. <laughs> no? That's self-centeredness that they talk about in this fellowship. You know? Standing on the, on the corner in 1972, I'm 13 years old. My crew, three topics, drinking beer, smoking weed, climbing in out of girls' bedroom windows in the middle of the night. I'm batting zero, zero, zero. <laughs> you know, my, mom, my mom didn't go for that. Man, I went to school. I went to church. I went to ball practice. I was at the house. I ain't, you know, but I'm standing out there with the fellas. I knew these guys since I was two years old. I'm standing out there with the fellas, and I ain't letting them know that I don't know, you know. Remember them dogs they used to put in the back window of the car with the head going like this? That's me. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Oh, wasn't that good? Yeah. 
I'm 13 years old. I'm telling people I've been places I ain't been. I've done things I haven't done, and I know people I don't know. You know? I am willing to compromise everything that I've been taught and believed to be true in this life to gain your acceptance. I'm empty on the inside. I have no sense of self. Mama used to talk to me a lot after my brother died, and she used to say, oh, Kenny, God's been good to you. You're going to have a wonderful life. I used to look at my mother and say, you know what, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what you're talking about, but here's what I, here's what I got in mind. Um, I ain't got no desire to be a service to God, you or anybody else. You want to know what I want out of life, I can tell you very quickly. My, I want mine. I want to get it my way, and I'm going to really need you to leave me alone while I'm doing it because I got a different plan than you got. And my mom used to get that sad look on her face and she said, y'all, you know, you don't get it. We didn't raise you that way. And I put my finger in her face. I said, you the one who don't get it. Get out the way. Watch me roll. 14 years old, I make a conscious decision that uh, once I'm old enough to call my own shots, I'll never again darken the door of a church. And I made that happen. I call that a reverse third step. I have never from the day that my darkest day is drinking. I have never doubted the existence or the power of God. I have never doubted it. But I made a decision that that's not the way I want to do it. I had a better way. You know, you weak. You ain't me. You need that. So I used to tell mama, I don't need that. You know, one of the gifts God did give me, I did well in school. You know, I'm a guy who is not challenged by school. And the truth of the matter is this. I can absorb huge amounts of information in short amounts of time, and I know how to take a test. I found out when I got to college, that does not make you a good student. <laughs> so you can't bluff your way through where I went to school. This lady said to me before I went off to college, they're going to require something of you down there. I was like, you ain't talking to the kid. <laughs> no. The kid, the kid was on academic probation three times. Huh? <laughs> But I was sitting in study hall one day watching people doing their homework. And uh, you know, my sponsor, Bill, told me when I came in the program, he used to run a treatment center called Compass House in Lorraine. He used to take me in his office and, and yell at me. And they had them old, like, plywood doors. Everybody in the building could hear it, but he'd always close the door like nobody could hear it, you know. <laughs> and we went in there one day, and he was yelling at me. And he said, anytime you in a room alone, all your enemies are there. <laughs> and he was referring to this. I was sitting in study hall one day. I had a visit from the enemy. My thinking, here's what the enemy told me. You know, can't these people in here breaking their neck trying to get B's and C's, taking general math and science. You take a calculus, physics, fourth year, Latin, fourth year, English. You sleep in class. You're getting straight A's. You know, it just might be entirely possible that I knew everything. I had no evidence to support that thought as being true. I accepted it as a fact. I left the room and took action on it. I went home, told that to my mother and father. My father, I believe, intended to strangle me when he came up off that couch. <laughs> Mama was quick, grabbed the back of his T-shirt. I broke for the screen door. I got outside that screen door. I closed the screen door. My father came up to the screen door, and he pointed his finger at me. And he said, boys, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you have a hard life because can't nobody tell you nothing. You think you know everything. And uh, I stood on that porch and I laughed in my daddy's face. It's a significant day in my life. On that day, I closed the door. If honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness are the three essentials of recovery, and I truly do believe that they are, like our book says. <coughs> on that day, I closed the door. From that day forward, you couldn't tell me nothing. Mother, father, preacher, teacher, later on, police, judges, lawyer, probation, PO. You can't tell me because I already know it, and if I don't know it, it ain't worth knowing. It became my philosophy of life. No. And that's the way that I looked at the world. Everybody in the world is stupid, but can't. I'm scared of you, but I know everything. Bottom line is this, I'm 14 years old, I'm a basket case, and I ain't even had a drink yet. Got in the car with a guy I played basketball with in high school. He wanted to get something to drink. We went through the carryout. We bought 10 quarts of Slith Small Liquor Bull. In Bill's story, Bill said, I forgot the strong warnings and prejudices of my people concerning drink. So did I. Alcoholism don't run in my family at Gallup's. And I have been told, <laughs> we do not do alcohol well. Look at your Uncle Ed, look at Junior, look at Bobby. I'm going to tell you, 
we are here in Western Pennsylvania. I done some drinking up here. I done some drinking with my uncles up here. I'm talking moonshine up in these hills. My family worked in these coal mines out here. I'm th I done some drinking up here. Killed a whole lot of my family. Just buried a cousin two months ago in Pittsburgh. Drank herself to death. But I'm willing to do anything to fill that up. Had that funny feeling in my gut from the time I was probably 10 or 11 years old. Thought everybody had it. In here they talk about a hole in your gut or not in your stomach, whatever that thing is. But this, this, just this feeling of being disjointed, this feeling of just not being right. Dropped the convertible top on that car, drove through the streets of Sandusky. We drank them 10 quarts of Slith's Mall Liquor Bull. Johnny drank five, I drank five. My life changed. I went from shy, insecure, and afraid to bold, confident, suave, debonair, and fearless in about 20 minutes. It is hard to describe in words that I know that exist in my vocabulary, the power that I felt that day. I, I heard a guy in California say a, feel, a feeling of temporary omnipotence. I like that. All of a sudden, I ain't scared of you no more. We went behind the Derrick apartments where all the thugs hung out pulled up. Johnny is one of these cool guys. Johnny got a pocket full of money running around with the kind of girls I run away from. You know, Johnny, Johnny one of them cool, man, JC, going into gambling spots. And I used to follow Johnny. He was two years older than me. He was captain of the basketball team. That, that was my cat. And uh, we went in there and uh, it was behind the Derrick apartments and dudes surrounded the car. And I hadn't said five words in public in the last three years. I told Johnny to turn that music off because there's a few things I wanted to tell a few people that was there that day that I had been wanting to tell them for quite some time. I went around that group of people and I told each and every one of them not only what I thought of them, but what they needed to do, in my opinion, to improve themselves. <laughs> people leaning in the car hugging me. See, now, mm. See, I told you Coleman was all right. He loosened up, he drank in a little bit. I told you, he, I told you Coleman, I'm, man, I'm hearing this. When you spent your whole life feeling on the outside, when you think you get in, it's a powerful feeling, ain't it? Went over to some of the home of some of them girls he run around with, I run away from. Never been over there in my life. Walked in there like I was paying the mortgage. I went in and sat down at the dining room table, and I looked at a young lady. I just seen her about a week ago. She worked at a bank. I still think she was the finest girl come out of Sadusky High School in 160 years. I had never, man, I used to, man, I see her coming, I duck in the bathroom. I looked over there at her. She was sitting in the corner. She looked up at me. I said, come here. And she got up and started walking toward me. And I'm like, man. what I always wanted. A sane person would have probably thought if you weren't so shy and scared, you could have just spoke up, look what you did, that ain't what I did. Here's what I thought, and talk about this thing up here. If you had been drinking before now, look what you could have done. You notice how alcohol's the victor. Look what you could have done. Look what you've been missing. I always say it's an honest program, and it's, I'm gonna be honest with you tonight, when she got over there to me, I had no idea what to do with her. <laughs> for all the talking that I do, you know, but I watch a lot of TV and I know what some more TV watchers into some of y'all. Uh, a lot of guys in here that was home on Friday night. I patted my lap and she sat down in my lap and my life changed again. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, hey, man. And I'm looking at Johnny and Johnny looking at me going, hey, you know. I, I, see, I can't tell you, and I want you to I want you to understand something. It created something in me, not just the particulars of that whole thing, but it created something in me that I was to chase for almost the next 20 years. A book causes a sense of ease and comfort. 
well-being, whatever however you want to say it, completeness, wholeness, for somebody who every day of their life felt on the outside. Do you know how powerful this was for me? And that's the kind of thinking that was to persist in me for a long, long time. Alcohol, and my sponsor, alcohol is always the victor, never the problem. Blizzard of 78. Anybody remember the blizzard of 78? I was a sophomore in college. They found me sitting out in the snow, snow six, seven feet, drift six, seven feet high, sitting on the steps of the dormitory in a blackout. Sub-zero, 70-mile-an-hour wind, I'm sitting out there in a blackout. Two guys found me, picked me up, took me in the dorm, went in my pocket, found my key, had my room number on it, took me to my room, put me to bed. No, I said the next day, don't you? Good thing I was drinking. That alcohol kept me from freezing to death. <laughs> you may say that if you weren't drunk, you wouldn't have been out there in the first place. <laughs> alcohol saved me. <laughs> Drove my car around the city of Sandusky without any brakes on it. Now, and I got to tell you, you know, <laughs> that's a problem unto itself. But I'm riding around in a car, ain't got no brakes on it. 9.30 on a Sunday morning, blind drunk. Flipped that car over to the corner of Columbus Avenue and Taylor Street. Smashed the roof of the car to the level of the door. Fire department cut me out of that car. 200 people out on the street. 9.30 on a Sunday morning. I blew like a 267. And I hadn't had a beer in four or five hours. You know, I said the next day, don't you? This is a good thing I was drinking. I was limber. <laughs> I'd have been, if I had been sober, I'd have stiffened up, broke my neck, I'd be dead now. Oh, my God, alcohol saved me again. Do anybody relate to this kind of thinking? <laughs> Our book says that if you got this kind of thinking and this kind of thinking, the person with alcoholic tendencies, physical allergy, it probably placed himself beyond human aid and the less locked up of that may die or go permanently inside. I can't see, man. I'm surrounded by people who can see. I've been screamed at by the best. Academic advisors in college, coaches, parents, girlfriends, family. My answer is this. What? <laughs> who? Family Thanksgiving dinner. Walked in the front door. Eight women in the living room grabbed their purse at the same time. <laughs> no, and I was offended. <laughs> what? See, y'all, that's why I don't come around, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And I had got every one of them. Every one of them. You better not put none down. Get paid on Friday morning, broke by 1 o'clock Friday. Y'all know what that's about, don't you? You got a price of a pack of cigarettes or a cheap 40 ounce. I lived like that for years. Not, I didn't, see, I want you to understand something. I didn't live like that for a couple years, a few months. I lived like that for the better part of 20 years. And I burned up everybody in my life. My mother looked at my girlfriend one day and said, if you don't get away from him, you'll never have any kind of life. I'm going to tell you about the disease that I have. It's a paralyzing disease. It doesn't allow me to live. It allows me to exist. I'm a guy who stands on the sidelines of life and congratulates you as you go by and your life progresses. Congratulations on that new job. Congratulations on that baby. Congratulations on your upcoming wedding. See, I'm always amazed sometimes because i got to remember that my experience is my experience. When I'm drinking, my disease is active. I don't have no wife. I can't. I don't, I don't have children. I can't. I don't own a home or anything of substance or value. I can't. 
when I pick up a drink, it is lights out. It is all I can think about. It is all that I can do. I'm sorry. That's my story. Congratulations on that new wedding. My college roommate was getting married. And I mentioned that in front of my mother. My mother looked at my girlfriend and said, if you don't get away from this tramp, you ain't going to never have what she does. At the end, no baths, no showers. Working about two days a week. Only reason I had a job is because I had a union to back me. And it got to the point where they didn't even want to. You know what I did? I had an answer for that. I ran for union committeeman myself. <laughs> I was a jailhouse lawyer. If you stayed in trouble as much as I did at work, I had the whole contract memorized. Committeemen used to come and ask me what to do about a given situation based on the contract because I knew the whole, I had to defend myself constantly. <laughs> now that's what my life was like. But in the end, just walking dead, man. Just walking dead. Stinking. Living, I, I, I used to be in this room, beer cans this deep. My cousin told me one time that she came by there with my mother, and my mother opened the front door and stood in the door, and I was laid on the couch, passed out drunk, and just cried. You know, just, just, you know. I was 16 years old. I came home at 4 o'clock in the morning. I had a 1 o'clock curfew. My mom was on the couch, tears rolling down her face. She said, we owe your roof over your head, food to eat, clothes on your back, and an education, and we've done our part. She said, Kenny, I got something you can't have, and that's my peace of mind. She said, you going to penitentiary or the cemetery, and you ain't taking me with you. I'm done. I'm giving you to God. Go. Do what you want. I'm done. You ain't going to worry me to death. Thank God my mother did that. My response to that, of course, was, I broke you. you know, I broke you. And, you know, be honest with you, I'm a little disappointed because it wasn't even that hard. I walked away laughing. That's me at 16. Th at 32, I got a liver that's distended about seven or eight inches. Every time I take a drink of alcohol, I cough up bile. My liver and my pancreas are no longer functioning. My body is now rejecting what my mind is obsessed with. I'm 32 years old and I'm dying of alcoholism. I tell people I was prayed in here. I didn't come here of my own volition because I didn't know you existed. I came out of a bar with my brother called a pump lounge out on Route 4. 11.30 at night, supposed to be to work at 12. If I'm one second late to work, I'm fired. A dirty urine, I'm going to prison for five years. Boy, that, you know, I got a five-year sentence in Mansfield, which is the state penitentiary in Ohio, suspended, and this is what the judge told me. Can't so much as a aspirin in your system when you come to report. And I'm sending you for them five, and I ain't talking about five months in shock. You going for five. This is one of the most dismal records I have ever seen. And we tired of you. My uncle, my mother's brother, was the mayor of Sandusky at that time. And my mother was a prominent person in the community. She said, I know your mother, I know your uncle. So before I throw you away, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'm telling you, Kent, one dirty urine, and you're gone. The first day that I had to go report to adult probation was one week later. I got off work at 8. Adult probation opens at 9. I'm riding through town, and here's the thought that came to me. You know, they never test you on your first time reporting. They don't <laughs> think anybody's that stupid. So I stopped off the Super Bowl lounge, had a doubleheader, old granddad, that called for another one, showed up at adult probation, first time reporting with five years over my head, stinking drunk. Do you understand? Did anybody follow that? Y'all relate to that? I got my mind, I'm sorry. Unless I get a power greater than myself, I'm doomed. 
I'm the guy they talk about in the doctor's opinion. I can't break that. I'm sorry, I can't. If I could decide not to drink and not drink, I wouldn't need you. One of the worst, my sponsor told me one of the worst statements in here is he'd rather be drunk than sober. He'd rather be drunk than sober. If he's alcoholic, he ain't, he ain't got no choice. There's people who choose not to follow the path of sobriety. That's true. But when a new person come in here and go out, I don't sit around and say he'd rather be drunk than sober. I ask myself as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous that I extend to him the hand of Alcoholics Anonymous and offer to share with him the solution that we have found. For that I am responsible, not what he do with it. I had what they call a moment of clarity, a moment of sanity in the parking lot of the pump. Um, heard a guy say one time, that's the moment when God paralyzes the liar in you long enough for you to see the truth. And for the first time in almost 20 years, my head cleared as clear as it is right now. And this is what I saw. Ken, if you don't stop drinking, you're going to die. You better get some help because you can't do it by yourself. You better do it now because you're running out of time. Out of nowhere. I'm serious. Out of nowhere. My last three years drinking, I was desperately trying to stop. I wasn't telling you that. I used to sit up at night with a Bible in this hand and a Miller High Life in this hand. I used to go to church, sit there, and wait for the magic to happen. Man. I used to look at Mama. Mama glowed with it. My mother walked in this room right now, God rest her soul, to get twice as bright in here. How do you get it? How do you get that? I would leave because it wasn't, and I'd go drink. See, what I never did was change the way I live. Went home, called a guy I went to college with. It was my business partner in college. Our business was not legal. <laughs> and today he's a doctor. He's a very, very powerful brother, and I called him, because I, I didn't know who else to call. I said, Rich, a doctor, man, he'll help me. Maybe. I owed him five grand, hadn't paid him none of it back. Didn't really know if he'd take a call from me. His wife answered the phone, and this is what she said and how she said, Richard is Kent. But that's the way everybody talked about me. And uh, Rich got on the phone, and uh, I said, Rich, it's your boy, man. I need some help. And this is what he said to me. Man, I've been waiting for this call for seven, eight years. Pack a bag. Stay by the phone. I got you. And I'm going to tell you something. And I always say this. When my phone rings at 3 o'clock in the morning with a call from the North Central Intergroup of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know what I tell them, don't you? Pack a bag. Stay by the phone. I got you. Rich, um, Told me, don't go to work. They're going to fire you. So I want you to come down here. I'm going to put you in treatment. Got up the next day. My brother and his wife in the front seat, me in the back seat. Now, I didn't know too much about treatment, but I figured out one thing on my own because I am kind of smart. <clears throat> I figured out it wasn't serving no liquor in there. So I got a case of Jennies for the trip. Me and I got 24 buddies in the back seat. I start chugging them Jennies as we going on I-75. I got six or seven of them cold ones in me, and here's the thought that came to me on my way to treatment. <laughs> you know, I just may have overreacted here. <laughs> but ain't that what a few drinks do for you? Man, I used to go down to this bar called Ev's Corner. Man, Ev had a Doberman pincher like this. Ev didn't have no gun in his bar. He had a Doberman. he go like this, you up, you know. And I'd go in there, man, that dog would be howling. You know, Ev would be behind the bar. I'm homicidal, suicidal, shaking out of my skin. I'm 30 years old. Ev would turn around, give me an eight ounce water glass of Granddad, put a cold Miller's down. I shoot that Granddad down, get that Miller's behind it. Five minutes later, I'm pumping quarters in the jukebox and telling some old woman she's in for the night of her life. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's the fact produced by alcohol, baby. Goes like a womb. Hey, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. Five minutes later, I'm looking for a rope to hang myself. No, I, it's, I, it's, whoo, that's, oh, man. 
What I didn't know is my daddy told my brother and his wife he'd give him $100 not to bring that tramp back here. I'm serious, he did. Got down there. Richard drove me from Centerville to Xenia, put me in treatment, and uh, bought me a quarter Miller's for the trip. And we got in the parking lot. He put his car in park. He turned. He looked at me. Got the biggest smile I've seen on his face to this day. And he said, go ahead, dog. Finish that. And don't ask me how I know it, man. Is that the last drink you're ever going to take? 17th of May, 1992. Have not had another drop of alcohol or anything stronger than I asked him since that day. I would have never believed it possible. Treated me great at the hospital. Had some liver problems. I spent nine days in a hospital bed. I came out. They put me in men's group and treatment with a counselor, right? They got guys reading out loud stories of their drinking escapades in the streets. Counselor says to me, well, Kent, your first day in group, tell us what you think. I said, I'll tell you what I think, Jim. <laughs> Well, I'm down here for a few days to get help for this small problem that I might have, I would like to volunteer my time, services, and energy to help you with these people because these are the sickest people I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> you know? That statement got me an extra week of treatment. I spent 35 days in a 28-day program. They cut my insurance off after 28 days. They called uh, out to the plant, and they said, we don't think Kent's ready to leave the hospital. You know what they said out to the plant? We don't either. <laughs> well, they allowed me to stay another week. I went through phase one twice. And uh, had me write and read to the group. I did. I got done. Jim said, put your chair in the middle of the room. Let's make a circle around Kent and tell him what we think of him. I think Kent's so full of BS. His eyes are turning brown. If you threw him in water, he'd float away. <laughs> Nicest thing that was said in that room that day. What them guys told me in that room that day was if I didn't get honest with myself, I was going to leave that place and I was going to die. And I'm going to tell you something. To the best of my knowledge, I'm the only person to stay sober out of them people. And they saved my life. I went back to my room, I sat on the edge of my bed, and I said, you know, your whole life you've been a fake and a phony. For once, just for once, why don't you give this a try? And I made a decision to try to be as honest as I could, which wasn't very honest, but this is a progressive thing on both sides of the ball. Went to my first AA meeting there, loved it. Loved the sharing, loved the, the, the non-judgmental behavior. Lady had a problem, they shared it with her, nobody condemned her, judged her, criticized her. I loved the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous the first time I saw it. And I know it won't happen for a lot of people, if it ain't happened for you yet, keep coming back. Got out of treatment after 35 days, I came home and I played a game, it's called Don't Drink, Go to Meetings and Don't Do Nothing Else. Because I have figured I don't need all the stuff that you need, okay? I'm not drinking. I'm going to these meetings. I like these meetings. I put my arm through a window. I cut an artery in my arm. I start bleeding all over the floor. I put a towel on my arm. I drive myself to the hospital. I run in the emergency room. Doctor says, come on back, Mr. Coleman. We'll treat you now. I sit there in the emergency room, bleeding all over the floor. I tell the doctor, no, thank you. I'll just sit here, and I bleed to death in the emergency room. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the emergency room. I've been in this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous long enough now. I watch people who attend these meetings on a daily basis die of untreated alcoholism. The treatment for the disease that I have is a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. Period. Period. A man walked up to me after a meeting, Mr. Willie Witherspoon, God rest his soul, and Mr. Willie said, boy, sitting in a chicken coop don't make you no chicken. You have to do something up in here. I went to 250 AA meetings in three months. And the people who live where I live will tell you that I did that. I went to meetings morning, noon, and night. I got off work at 8 o'clock in the morning, went down to the club. I went down to the noon meeting, the 1 o'clock meeting. Then I went home, ate, took a shower, went to bed, got up, went to a meeting at 8 o'clock, went to work at midnight. I did that on a daily basis for three months. And at the end of three months, I ended up in the parking lot at Daly's Pub in downtown Sandusky. Because not drinking don't make me better, it makes me worse. My problem ain't alcohol, it's alcoholism. And until I treat my alcoholism, I'm just a really, really sick person sitting in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I used to say that I didn't get nothing out of them 250 meetings, but that's a lie. Because when I'm sitting in the parking lot of Daly's Pub, I said a prayer. Where did I get that? At an AA meeting. It's the first prayer I said in three months. God, what am I doing wrong? Because I know if I go in Daly's Pub, I ain't coming out. Immediately, I get the answer, what are you doing right? You're not doing one single solitary thing that's being suggested in here. If you go to that many meetings, you hear it every day. Get a sponsor, work the steps, get a home group, get active, help others. I ain't doing none of that. I treated AA like a cigarette smoking donut dunking coffee clatch. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I did in here, you know. 
And so I ended up in the parking lot of Daly's Pub. So them 250 meetings, not only did I know what I was supposed to be doing, I also know, knew who to go to to do it. And I pulled out of there and I went to an AA meeting and I went up to a man and I asked him to help me. And the man said, no, what link are you willing to go to? I said, be careful what you tell me because I'm going to do it. He said, I'm going to sponsor you out of the book. He said, it's the only thing that I know. They call it 12 Steps a Kid of Spiritual Tools. I got a toolbox at my house. I ain't never sat in my living room, watch them tools walk across the floor of my house and fix a thing. The only value of a tool is if I pick it up and use it. The only value of these steps is if I apply them to my life. I've had the great privilege of seeing this fellowship all over the world. I have yet to attend an AA meeting where somebody stands up and says, works if you know it. Me and Ralph gonna get into the steps tomorrow. I'm gonna close up just by talking about a little bit about the ninth step. You know, I did get a chance to make amends to my mom. My mom was still alive when I got sober. My mother died when I was almost two years sober. I went back into that home because my house wasn't a safe place. My house was a spot, it wasn't a house. And I went back into that home to help my dad take care of my mom. My mom had bone cancer and um, on a daily basis. My mom saw me go to AA meetings on a daily basis. My mom saw me bring sponsees to the house. My first sponsees, God bless them. A lot of them guys are still sober. And we'd sit at that dining room table and we'd get into that big book. My mom saw me put on a shirt and a tie and go speak at an AA meeting when I didn't have a suit. My mama saw y'all come into my life and my mama saw my life start to change. And when I went to make amends to my mom, I had a big speech planned out. And, you know, when the time came, I looked at her. She looked at me, tears running down her face and tears running down mine. And the only thing that would come out of my mouth was, Mama, I'm sorry. Now, my mother knew exactly what I was doing. My mother raised me this way. She knew exactly what I was doing. And my mama smiled at me and she said, I forgive you. My mama died holding my hands and looking in my eyes in a hospital room with my whole family up there calling her name. My Uncle Amos stood in the back of the room and said, don't call her no more because she ain't going to look away from that boy. That's how she wants to go. And that's how my mother left this earth. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I've been blessed a million times over, but if I never got nothing but that, that was enough. Thank God for the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I met and married a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. She's sober two years longer than me. Reminds me of that on a daily basis. <laughs> my wife was... Uh, Kathy was 20 years sober, uh, September 29th. And uh, my wife, I always tell people, my wife is one of God's girls. For one thing, she put up with me. Because, mm -hmm. see, I ain't part of I'm going to tell you, a lot of days, I am no day at the beach. No. Uh, a friend of mine in Canada, Butch, say, you know, if you think it's going to be all sunshine and roses up in here, you better buckle up. <laughs> no. And uh, my wife, uh, She's the chairman of the Institutional Committee for Women in our district, and she goes into the jails and institutions. She's a cardiovascular intensive care nurse. Um, I always tell people this, and I mean it truthfully. I don't have to go to AA meetings to see how this program is supposed to be lived. I got it in my house. I wish I could do this. My wife wears this like a loose garment. I wish I could do it a tenth as well as she does. I got two little girls, ages 14 and 9, look like my wife and my mother combined. I got some beautiful little girls that just like me. Stay tuned. I take him to see my father, they wreck his house in like 10 minutes, and I tell my dad, man, I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with him. He said, I do, they're yours. <laughs> Get them out of here. <laughs> I ended up going back to school, and uh, you know, I had a really good time at Ford Motor Company, and uh, I ended up in the marketing sales and service division in Dearborn, and I retired in 2007, and was talking to Fran and Mo and Ralph earlier, and today I'm on. Uh, project manager of a pretty big uh, nonprofit in Cleveland that serves the developmentally disabled and we do, uh, we actually have our own factory and I oversee that today. And what, what if you knew in here, okay. I'm gonna share something with you before I go. Relapse is not a requirement for recovery. You do not have to go back out there no more. It's a lot of people up in here who came up in here and stayed you don't have to, there's not an individual in this room who ever has to drink again if you don't want to. But there are a few requirements, aren't there? <laughs> there are a few requirements, as our book says. How about trust God, clean house, and help others? Um, they gave me a tape of a man named Warren Chisholm when I first came in the meeting. 
12th man in AA in Cleveland, Casober, 1939, in that tape, Warren Chisholm says something that raised a hair on my arms. He said, there's no individual in this program, if any individual in this program will follow the 12 steps as outlined by the founders in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, they need never drink again one day at a time. I said to my sponsor, that's a heck of a statement, how can he say that? And my sponsor looked at me and he said, it's real simple, son. He said, it's because this is a spiritual program and God doesn't fail. There is no failure in connection with this. God doesn't fail. If this don't work for me, it's because I have not fulfilled the conditions that have been laid down. I must participate in my own recovery. God will not do for me what I can do for myself, but he will do for me what I cannot do for myself. If I said anything that helped anybody tonight, get a praise, the honor, and the glory to God. And myself, I am nothing. My strength comes from my Father in heaven. If I didn't say nothing to help you tonight, guess what? Y'all going to get Ralph in a few. Uh, God does not make too hard turns with those who seek him. God could and would if he were sought. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you. Until then, good night. <laughs>